Do UFOs exist or are they a figment of the imagination? Can over three and a half thousand military and civilian pilots who have reported UFO sightings over the past 40 years be mistaken? Not to mention the tens of thousands of ordinary people throughout the world who have seen things in the sky that they cannot explain. Ever since 1996, when I first witnessed an unidentified flying object in broad daylight hovering over London, I have devoted myself to the daunting task of trying to unravel the UFO mystery. I decided to make this documentary to chronicle my journey of discovery. A journey that would take me around the world, searching for the intangible. I wanted to know one way or another, whether there is anybody out there. And I saw, in the distance, I had sort of uh, three or four, sort of really in the distance, silver spheres. And this just, they just appeared while I was there on my own. And I was just thinking, wow, I wish Chris was here with me to witness this. As I was just like going, wow, this is incredible. One sphere, one sphere appeared, but this was a lot lower. And as this appeared, I could hear footsteps behind me. And this was Chris. And I was going, wow, Chris, look, look what I'm looking at here. We get our cameras out and start filming, and then this thing just disappears. People can see these things if you look for them. You've got to spend the time looking and have the commitment, and then these things will appear. They did for me, they can for you. Well, in uh, about three or four days, uh, me and Jonathan are going to be heading to Las Vegas for a... Uh, UFO conference and we're hoping to visit some uh, sensitive areas. There's a place called Area 51 which is uh, lots of rumours attached to it about uh, recovered alien sources and uh, some very strange things have been happening so we're hoping to, to take the camera there with us um, but certainly whatever we see we're going to film and um, what we see you'll see so um, we've got our fingers crossed. describe how much of this is science and how much of this is hype and commercialism. Uh, what's the breakdown? Over three and a half thousand military and civilian pilots have reported UFOs, risking threat to careers and ridicule from colleagues and such like as well at the same time. By the same token, there have been over 30,000 hitherto classified UFO documents released since President Carter brought in, in the Freedom of Information Act on the 4th of July 1974. Right, that's a lot of stuff. Yes, of course What's the one thing that, that really needs to happen before you can say for sure one way or the other? Once people get used to that idea that life has been found out there, albeit microscopic, biological, albeit billions of years old, then all of a sudden this vast universe of ours that people keep telling us is dead and there's nothing out there, uh, it opens up a whole new ball game. And uh, I think one of the reasons why, if I may say, um, UFOs and such like haven't landed on the White House lawn as yet, is that I think if there is any advanced extraterrestrial civilization out there, anybody taking a look at what a pretty lousy job we're making of uh, our lot here on Earth would, would wish to keep the distance. Right, go somewhere else. Yeah, for Thanks. sure. All right, thank you very much. This week, hundreds of UFO researchers and people curious about the unknown are making their way down Nevada's lonely highways en route to Laughlin for the 10th annual UFO Congress. The event is filled with people who believe they've seen UFOs, even a few people who say they've been abducted by aliens. You at least have to have the alien money to be able to buy your freedom. 
The main exhibit hall is filled with unusual photos and wacky alien souvenirs, but the convention does have its more academic side, with scientists and professors giving lectures on what they've learned about the possibility of alien activity. The question that we're all looking at is, are we alone in the universe or is there more out there? Unfortunately, nobody seems to have proof one way or the other. The UFO convention is being held at Laughlin's River Palms Resort, the giant inflatable alien may give you a clue that you've arrived at the right location. In Laughlin, Steve Krupe, News 13, inside Las Vegas. See it? It's very, very, very high up. Could you just... Can you see it? How near to the moon? It's coming towards us now. It's about... One o'clock. Now, right, look like there. Yeah. Look, see there? Yeah. Look at the moon. Yeah. Now just keep looking like that. How far along? It's very, very high up. I've literally been out here 20 minutes and uh, I've seen way up in the distance uh, a silver, silver ball similar to the ones that have been sighted in Mexico that Chris has filmed in London and it's appeared about, uh, about 20 minutes ago and it's, it's, it was incredible. But it was so far away. Uh, I've got my camcorder out, I've tried to film the area that I saw it in. It, it was that adrenaline buzz you get when you see something like that. And uh, it's incredible, you know, that they are here. Amazingly, we had managed to log a UFO sighting above our hotel within just a few short days. It seemed our arrival had not gone unnoticed. Next up on my itinerary was a live interview with KTOX, a local radio station. We have a couple, two purple buildings. Oh, really? In Sedona? Mm. No, here oh, in Bullhead. Oh, here in Bullhead. Oh, okay. Well, they, they have to. That's the discipline. Today's guests. Clarissa Bernhardt, she predicts earthquakes. She, is, uh, she was the first to demonstrate that the sixth sense is real by two days in advance predicting uh, of quakes. And we also have Christo Christopher Martin. He is a, uh, uh, I imagine you are, you've written some books. You've got some videos out. And uh, he is the author of Intruders <coughs> in the Night. And he does uh, tapes of UFOs over London. And welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Do these, uh, these spheres that you uh, have uh, videotaped, do they resemble in any way the, the uh, massive amount of uh, UFOs that have been caught on tape over Mexico City? Identical, yes. They're very, uh, very large metallic, uh, I'd say about 30 feet in diameter. They, sometimes there's a haze around them, like some kind of ionization around the, the Yeah, some, some sort of distortion in the atmosphere right, around yeah. it. I think it's important that we kind of gave as much hard physical evidence as possible because the kind of whole UFO phenomenon has got terrible press. As you all know, there, there was a thing on the ABC Channel 13 on uh, a couple of days ago on the uh, Laughlin uh, Congress, and it was typical tongue-in-cheek uh, send-up of the whole UFO ph phenomenon. We get that in London. Yeah, the, used to it. the uh, mainstream media has a tendency to go for the giggle factor yes, every time they talk about yeah. any, anything that's uh, mm. uh, either too spiritual or, or uh, mm. what they consider to be too far out there on the fringe. Yeah. It's like I told uh, all the gentlemen we've had here in the past, I, I've spent a tremendous amount of time all by myself out in the middle of the woods, uh, whether it's at home or whatever, I'm, I'm by myself and alone a lot. Uh, like two o'clock in the morning, mm just sitting on the hood of my truck, looking at the sky, thinking to myself, man, where are those guys? Uh, Christopher Martin will be giving his talk tomorrow at 2.30 uh, p.m. Uh, all this is taking place at the 10th Annual UFO Congress that is uh, happening at the River Palms Resort and Casino in Laughlin. I want to thank both of you for coming. It's been very interesting. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. We appreciate it. Well, I've just finished my lecture. Um, I've had kind of a favourable response by and large after the talk at the book signing. Quite a few people came up and congratulated me. Um, no real kind of negative feedback. So I think um, for a first 
attempt, if you like, at a, U a US audience. I think they, they it went down surprisingly well. Jonathan's gone off to Area 51. <coughs> he's going to be back in the early hours. Um, don't know what he's going to come back with. Maybe nothing, maybe some incredible UFO footage. Don't know. But I'm pleased, I've done my work, so I can uh, relax now. I think it's been fantastic and um, met a lot of interesting people. Um, Bob Dean's been here, Jaime Massan, um, you name it, they're all here. And, um, We've all made a lot of new friends, a lot of new contacts, and um, you know you just can't ask for a better week. I think um, I think one of the big highlights as well was watching Chris uh, show his footage and uh, talk. You know, on Thursday he he, uh, he just showed how uh, an ordinary person can uh, you know go out and uh, take footage of these craft over over London, and uh, he, he he spoke about how. Um, you know, how you just need a bit of time and dedication and uh, I think he's a guy who's just trying to live the reality, so it's great. <laughs> okay, everybody go like this, right? <laughs> Did you say you had seen something on another day? Uh, I've seen three spheres in the course of the week. Yeah. We've got a little bit on video oh, too, yeah. which we're going to um, have a look at when we get back to London. Well, I hope we see you there. Take care. Yeah. Take care. Have a good trip there. Perfect. Here we are. Here we are on camera again. Absolutely. Up in the bar, you know, meeting the beautiful young ladies from the show and, yeah, having fun. That's, that's what you do at night. That's what the night's for. That's what the night is for, absolutely. Well, here we are, last day at the uh, UFO Congress. It's the uh, it's been the EBE Awards, and uh, lots of drink has been flowing freely tonight. Everyone's had a good time. We fly back to London tomorrow, so it's only anything left for me to say is goodbye from Loughlin. Back in the UK, I wanted to forget about the tacky commercialization of the UFO phenomenon I'd witnessed in the United States, but which had left me with an even greater desire to connect with genuine people whose lives are being indelibly touched by the unknowns. With this in mind, I journeyed up to Stirling in Scotland, curious to meet a man who has spent many long hours logging on videotape some striking UFO activity, some of which defies conventional explanation. So I was, you know, I was sitting in my bedroom one night and I was just kind of looking out the window. I seen a, a star thing just dropping, dropping down the sky and it stopped. So a star can't do that. So I, I kept watching it. Say about 15 minutes later it moved back up to where it was before. And it stayed there for about another 10 minutes or so and then it started moving around the house. So I was going from bedroom to bedroom. And they were looking at it for the back, it just kept on going round and round the house for a couple of hours. I, f I filmed exactly the same thing, coming out of a cloud and moving up through the sky with spheres around it as well. It's, a, it's really strange. Uh, I don't know whether the spheres have came out of this object or not. But, uh, you can see all that cobweb stuff going by it as well. So Any it's really what, strange. What size is I was. You can see an aeroplane going by uh, later on, it's around about the same distance. Mm. And it's a jumbo jet, so I reckon it's about jumbo jet size. What is that? What the hell is that? Do you know what I mean? That there is a major UFO to me. It's out of doubt. Top notch. Look at it go to. Excellent. Whoa, what's he doing? What's that thing, man? 
Mas tem no baú isso. I was amazed by the images captured by Brian McPhee's camcorder. Clearly visible was a large tubular shaped UFO surrounded by smaller metallic spheres performing incredible maneuvers above the skies of Stirling. However, later that night, the unknowns were to appear yet again, this time whilst travelling on the M9 motorway just outside Edinburgh. Is that? That is, that is, that is, that is a triangle. What is this? It's huge at one time. Yeah, it was a whole side of, oh, I'm lost Lights, then I, I noticed there were three lights in a row. It's not a plane though, no, is it? Yeah, they were all flashing. And you, it wanted like a cascading effect. Oh, man. I wasn't even going to pull over at Jeez. one point. I can't believe it. Okay, we're in the hospitality suite at uh, this morning studios. Um, we've been asked to appear, well I've been asked to appear on the Richard and Judy show. Um, so I think that's great, you know, people will see some of the things I've been filming. So it's a, it's a great vehicle to uh, kind of spread the word as it were, you know. I'm all mic'd up, ready to rock. Rock and roll. About 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Bit nervous. We're going to talk to Dennis and see some remarkable video footage a bit later on. Stuff like that. That's later. You've written a book about this, haven't you? Well, about basically how I got involved in this. And I how was, did you get involved? I was going out with a, with a girl about five years ago who, who uh, claimed that she was having uh, kind of abduction experiences. And, uh, abduction experiences? Yeah, the alien abduction thing. Yeah. Yes. Do you believe her? Not at first, but um, the book kind of goes into details about some of the, the things that began happening, paranormal mm. events. Um, mm. what, what do you make about these mass observations? Well, I think we're li I'm very excited because I think we're living in... in, in very important times. I think we're going to see a, a bigger pro proliferation of uh, mm -hmm. these appearances on mass at, at kind of rock concerts and sporting events. I think we're going to first contact in, mm. in our lifetimes, I believe. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Hi, we're on the media bandwagon again. This time it's Channel Five uh, Morning News, six a.m. Not sure what they're how they're going to cover this, but uh, get some more exposure. So um, we'll see what happens. With us now is Roy Lake from UFO Studies and Chris Martin, author of Intruders in the Night. Thank you both very much for coming in. What about this, uh, this photo? I'll hold this up for... Uh, this is a, an artist's see. representation of what we saw in Scotland, just the proceeding... Th well, this was the video. first clip we showed, yes. the one in black yes. with the red light. This is what you saw. This is a, a good representation. You can see it's a black deltoid-shaped... Uh, so get on that. It was so a this is what you actually, actually saw, or this, is, saw. What sort this of is what we saw? This is what he saw. That's what you actually yeah. saw? By the time we, we stopped the vehicle and began filming, the thing was heading away. But that's only got like one red light. You've got like three yes, red lights. Yes, we're seeing the pictures of the red lights. They were flashing on and off all the time. Just and like it's L-shaped. Well, it's like a, yeah, they all say Delta, Deltoid. Well, okay. Roy, Chris, thank you both very much for coming in. Thank you very thank much you. indeed. Thank, thank you. you. We're outside the uh, t television building at the moment. We've just done our, our little stunt, hoping that it uh, gets out to the general public and uh, that we'll, we'll get uh, more, more people coming forward. Uh, it is important that they do this because uh, how the hell are we going to get to know what's going on in this, in this country? Because the military defence don't tell you nothing. Just rely on us all the time. The programme, I think, went very well indeed. Um, I mean, they're professional people and they were very nice anyway. There was no mickey taking and it was done quite well indeed. I'm, I'm over the moment anyway. <laughs> Okay, I've come to Talk Radio, um, which is a radio station based in London. Uh, I'm doing an interview with James Well on his um, nightly chat show. It should be fun, he's quite a uh, tough uh, questioner, so um, I don't think he'll give me a smooth ride, but um, that's all part of the uh, fun. A bit different from TV. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done a lot more TV than, than radio, I have to say that, so I'm, I'm probably a little bit more nervous and... and um, because with, with TV you've got the, the video medium, so you know I'm able to show my vi video footage 
and that's a, a big part of my work. So being on the radio, you know, you, you're kind of limited to, to just uh, speech, and um, that, that's, it, it's tougher. So how are you feeling now? Is it, is Still a bit nervous. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be I'll be happier when I'm in there and we're, we're on air. Um, and I've had dreams of a bit, you know, from about age seven or eight, being in my back garden in my parents' house, looking up and seeing this trail disappear into the sky. Hmm. Is it a dream or is it a memory of something? Now, you, you were telling me in the break before yep. that, that you'd seen a UFO, or there have been a few UFOs you've seen this weekend. Yes. Past, just gone. Just got, um, Sunday. Yeah. I was in the uh, the Three Mills uh, area in Bromley by Bow. Um, um, within, I'd say, 40 minutes. The old film, the film studio. Complex. Yeah, just outside oh, there, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw four little dots glinting in the, in the sunlight. What I saw was a, a swarm of spheres all around this cloud, mm. just kind of you know on on the edges, um, panned in. And then what 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 I saw next was was probably more amazing. I saw these uh, spheres kind of parting, another one coming through, the other ones going back in. Mm. And, and this kind of interaction. And balloons, which would be the obvious explanation. Did anybody else see them Can with you? I was on my own. Yeah. And I've got a digital camera. It's clearly mm. visible and uh, unprecedented as far as I know of London. How did it go for you? Well, it was a bit tough towards the end. I mean, some of the, there was a few kind of uh, sceptical people ringing in. And uh, after two hours of being on it, you know, you, st you do start to pick out. But I think all in all, um, I think I... Putting a good show. The last few days had been hectic, with several live television and radio appearances, and yet I was still apprehensive. I knew it would take a major breakthrough to shift public opinion to accept the reality of unidentified flying objects. However, within a few weeks there would be a sighting of an object totally unlike anything I had ever witnessed before. So we've just been sitting in the garden with the family and uh, we noticed a strange object up in the sky. Um, it looked like a really weird kind of horseshoe shaped object. We're not, we're not quite sure what it was. Um, everyone noticed it and uh, commented that it was very unusual. So um, again, it's not, nothing I've ever seen before, very strange. Um, and uh, I suppose it, it, it is actually a, a classic UFO in that it's unidentified. It doesn't look like a sphere or any other kind of UFO object we've seen or I've filmed before so um, I think this one's going to be uh, filed um, alongside the unexplainables. Can you see what it is? Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think it's an alien. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not an alien, it's a It's kind of wobbling around you. You get top of the tree and go down the app. Oh yeah, thanks. It's really odd. You can't get any close up. I've got right, I've zoomed right in there, yeah. No. That's no, no, weird. No, I can't see. You think? No, I can't see. It. It's very solid, chunky. No, I'm fine. I can't see. You see, you can see that cloud there, that cloud. Yeah. So you can see it. Just going into the cloud now. Open your flap. Oh, no, I don't know. I can No, it's coming fast now. It's gone into cloud now, hasn't it? Yeah. There was a, a quote that was bandied about once by um, by Edward Heath, by Ted Heath. Um, he said um, in an interview, um, I don't know what this interview was related to, but his quote was, um, the United Kingdom is the most secretive country in the Western world. Um, and that's, that looks like it, um, it could be true. Mm. Television coverage, it's always the and finally story. It's the, you know, they have all the major news events, and then right at the very end, you've got the, you know, the the one minute slot on the on the mad UFO field, um, and they're normally you know slated to to hell. Uh, I mean, I've I've talked to colleagues, um, and you know, I've said to them, what would it take for you to believe what I'm seeing is 100% true? Uh, and they say, oh, if a flying saucer landed on the the, on the ground, on the you know, on the outside of um, 10 Down Street, there, I said, what what would, what would um, if a member of government admitted to the fact, would that be enough to? He said, oh, so I don't think it would happen. But he, and they say, oh, it may not cause me to to be 100% certain, but it would definitely open my eyes. Yeah. And that, I think that's the thing. It's not the conversion of people to the cause, if you like. 
It's making them more open-minded, that there is something to this and it isn't a laughable matter. Out of all the uh, UFO sightings I've had over these past uh, four or five years, probably the most bizarre close encounter I experienced was here in this innocent looking tower block in Allgate in East London. Um, the actual event occurred uh, in June 1999. Um, it kicked off with a, an unusual appearance of a craft over in Oxley's Wood in South East London. Yeah. We were sitting on uh, not the first ridge down, but the second ridge in front of that chair there. That's right. Yeah. Down there. Um, Where did that thing come from? We looked over here, wasn't it? Approximately this area here. Yeah. Um, I turned round and there was this like small flash <coughs> in the sky yeah. around this area here, and I said, "Well, we've got to look at this area," and that's what we did for about a minute, two minutes, yeah. and then yeah. it literally came over from here that's right, yeah. to about here in the sky, yeah. I reckon. Yeah. And that, that was where this large cloud was. And it, it disappeared after about two minutes from there. What about uh, later on in the evening when uh, I rang you to say I'd seen the uh, sphere over at the tower block in Allgate? You that having, was very interesting. You, you rang up about, I think it was about nine in the evening. It was still, because yeah. it's middle of summer, it was, mm. it was really light and everything. Yeah. Um, family was away. Jane, Jane and the family were away. Amrit and Nilu were with me, they were staying the, like on and off for the week. Um, Nilu calls out, there's something in the garden, right? Come out immediately, come out quick, it's one of them UFO thingies. Mm. Right, so I immediately put the phone, I'm talking to Chris, had just seen something on the, actually, mm. I think it's all gate, yes, at that right. moment, you'd yeah. actually seen something. It was actually a few hours yeah. before I'd rung you. And I, I put yeah. the phone down on you <laughs> immediately yeah. Yeah. and rushed out and above Nilu and Amrit's head, literally, it couldn't have been 50 to 100 foot up, it was a silver, it was spinning, shining disc, just burnished silver colour mm. and spinning. Um, she was like standing there transfixed, Amrit was as well, and they could hardly say a word. It hung there for probably only a few seconds, mm. slowly picked up speed, shot off What's towards that? the area of the army barracks, which is west from us in the garden, yeah. Yeah. and it literally vanished. It just, no vapour trails, no nothing, it just, shot and vanished. Just three hours later that day, the visitors were to appear yet again, and this time at point-blank range, offering above a tower block in Allgate, East London. I can't tell you what prompted me to travel there, but there was a kind of, uh, just a premonition, if you like, that uh, there was going to be more UFO activity. OK, here we are on top of um, Denning Point, which is a 20-storey tower block here in Allgate in London. Now I arrived here roughly about uh, five o'clock uh, on that Sunday afternoon. Um, again I can't tell you what compelled me to arrive here, it was just a kind of sense that uh, I had to be here and there was, uh, there was going to be a, a appearance. Within probably about four minutes I looked up and right above me was this incredible uh, metallic sphere. Um, I've never seen anything so fantastic at such a close range. I'd say it was no more than about uh, 400 feet above, and I could actually see the, the texture and, the, and the, the, the kind of colour on the, the outline of the hull. It just hovered there probably for about a minute, then it began accelerating kind of towards that way, which is uh, South London, uh, picking up speed. I'd, I'd estimate it probably ended up travelling at about 100 miles an hour, so again that kind of negates the idea that it could have been a balloon or anything. Well, once I'd left uh, the top of uh, Denning Point, I was kind of pretty much given up seeing any more uh, UFO activity. So you can imagine my amazement when I uh, kind of looked up over there north, saw the sphere returning. Um, I literally took you know two two steps back because I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The thing came towards me, was slowing down, literally came to a complete halt above me, again at 90 degree angle. Hovered there, I'd say for about a minute, and then just blinked out, disappeared. Didn't see it uh, accelerate or go anywhere, it just disappeared. I realised then what, what we were dealing with here was uh, uh, an intelligent uh, phenomenon. Anyway, I got to see this footage and um, I thought this is remarkable. This surely must be one of the first pieces of film footage in the UK that just show an intelligently controlled object uh, in close contact with someone who's filming it. The manoeuvres, um, what it was doing, how it was behaving and how it disappeared and reappeared. To me, that is your typical sort of contact scenario. Um, you put the feelers out and they arrive and they, they behave in front of the camera for you. Certain skeptics in the UK started saying it's a weather balloon.
it's a toy balloon, you know, a circus balloon. Um, I thought, well, we've got to approach the right companies who deal with all these weather balloons to see if, in fact, you know, it, it is a weather balloon from the, from the perspective. Anyway, the initial run was to contact the Ministry of Defence, uh, which is a usual sort of thing. Uh, were you, did you have any sightings in the UK on that day? Anywhere, in London, anywhere. And I got the letter back from them, which you can see. It says, uh, Dear Mr Howe, I'm writing with reference to the message you left on the Air Star Secretary on phone on 15th December. You inquired whether we had received any reports of an unidentified flying object seen in the all area of London at approximately 5.17 on the 13th of June 99. I have looked back for our sighting report files and I can confirm that we received no other reports of UFO sightings for June 13th of June 99 from anywhere, remember, anywhere in the UK. We are satisfied that there is no corroborating evidence to suggest that United Kingdom's airspace was breached by unauthorised air activity, which, as you know uh, from previous correspondence, is our only interest in these matters. Now, that is interesting because the thing is, this film footage clearly shows an object which is within our airspace, which is very close to City Airport, which is at Docklands in East London, and it's also not very far from Heathrow. I thought, right, I've got to find out who makes these weather balloons. Uh, and the weather balloons are released at uh, Hurst Monceau in East Sussex and also in um, uh, East Malin, which is in Kent. I found out the time that they were being released and they did not coordinate with the uh, object that was filmed uh, by Chris at Allgate. So I contacted uh, this company uh, via Sala by phone and I spoke to the guy but I said to him look I need you as a professional to look at this stuff that I'm going to send you so you can confirm to me whether or not what you think it is. I did that and he sent me a letter back. He begins by saying dear Mr Howell thank you for your letter and CD. I write as a professional meteorologist with experience of using weather balloons. You may be interested in the following facts relating to weather balloons and he goes on to explain uh, release times and how you know balloon, b balloons behave but number three point he says here he says weather balloons usually rise rapidly typically three to five meters per second before bursting and falling to earth sometimes a balloon will be damaged so that either fails to climb or descend slowly this is not the behavior of the object which chris has filmed on this tape this object is uh transverse in the sky it's moving very fast it's stopping dead it's uh, no way shaped like a weather balloon, which you would say, I mean, he sent me, this is a weather balloon, which he sent me, right? Now, if you look at this weather balloon, there's a lip to it at the bottom. When this is blown up, this is pear shaped, okay? And also what you will see, you will clearly see the defined lip, it's where the suction the helium has gone in. On the, on the video that you see, which Chris has filmed, the object is completely spherical, completely spherical, and also got a haze around it, which I've yet to explain. Um, but you can clearly see from that that being a weather balloon, I personally, myself, would be clearly be able to define the shape of this, which I say is more or less pear shape when blown up, because as you can see it will stretch, um, to the object which is on the tape, which is totally spherical. So the weather balloon theory, as far as I'm concerned, is not a feasible one. You still see it? There. Oh, that bit cloud there, yeah. right above it. Oh, oh man. Oh man. It's low to the cloud, it's getting lower. Is it? I see it get lower. I can't, I can't get it in. I can't get it in the bloody shot. The viewfinder. We've just been out to three mils uh, for a sky watch. Um, can you just tell us what, what, you, what you filmed just now? Um, yeah. Uh, we first of all saw these helium balloons or something at first, and then we saw these sphere-like objects really mm. high up. Mm. Well, one there was, 
yeah, and it, it was quite windy, but this didn't seem to be moving, and it was uh, sort of shiny. It's very sort of stationary, um, sort of quite far away. Mm. Um, sort of the clouds sort of like uh, going past, mm. uh, but basically it seemed to be very sort of static, mm. and the yeah. cl clouds are going past. But but it, it I mean, it, it just could be. It just seemed to be very sort of high up. We've seen other footage. Really unusual, yeah. yeah. We, we've seen other very similar sort of footage, yeah. other, like like Mex Mexico and stuff like that, yeah. um, cloud level, sort of um, spherical light yeah. objects like mm. that, yeah. um, and, and obviously your, um, your your footage mm. that you've taken. So it seems very similar to that. Mm. Um, so the viewers are going to be watching, thinking, well, yeah. basically, are these UFOs? Are they well from elsewhere? Well, what, UFOs, definitely. Yeah. I'm pretty sure they're definitely UFOs. So mm. we're not helium balloons. Been a real uh, manic four days. Uh, on Wednesday we had a sphere appear over uh, the house in Lewisham in South London. Really unusual uh, kind of object seemed to be changing shape. And uh, we were here on Thursday. Uh, my colleague was in a micro light. And we he, we filmed um, a sphere again. And if you're gonna if you're gonna film something, film yes. it on the right hand side. All I'll right, make then. sure that I position you the. You always go the on the right. First time I've filmed something here that uh, we've seen in London many times. So, um, and of course, yesterday we, we were in uh, Three Mills and Bow, and uh, four of us uh, filmed a, a sphere hovering amongst the clouds. So it's been an absolutely mad uh, four-day period. In April 2002, I travelled to Australia to deliver a series of lectures around the country and was also curious whether the visitors would follow halfway around the world and put in another appearance. I flew into Perth in Western Australia where I would meet a woman who runs ACERN, the Australian Close Encounter Resource Network. Thirty years ago I trained as a nurse and midwife and then I um, was trained into counselling about 15 years ago and I worked in a medical practice in England for five. In the meantime we, we were looking at going overseas and, and um, Australia seemed a really good bet because it's still a very much a sort of culture we're used to. In the meantime I got some people with very interesting experiences coming to me saying look I don't know where to go but these things are happening, I don't know if I'm going crazy and all that kinds of things. And the one that was very significant was my f very first experiencer and he said things have been happening to me that are freaking my family out yeah. particularly my partner you know we're waking up in other other sides of the bed i wake up in the morning there's a shaved area on my leg and he said and marks and my my partner's um daughter's having marks on her body we you know we we don't know what what's going on but she's really freaked and he says the trouble is there's support groups for everything he says but for this he says if you talk about it people just think you're loony yeah. I was actually doing advanced counselling at the time and I took this to supervision, the case study. Nobody could give me any insight. They were all fascinated, but they, they couldn't come to, to any conclusions. I found I was educating them. And I thought, what's the point of this? You know, they don't, they're not helping. I'm, you know, I'm doing a course where we're talking about human experience and they, they haven't got a clue. So I decided to do my own research. And from that, I met uh, another lady who was a social worker that had her own experiences. And we started up a support group. I wish I could show you City Beach and then some of the houses there. They'll blow your socks off. Later that evening, we travelled up into the hills overlooking Perth to conduct a skywatch. 
Both Mary and myself felt a sense of anticipation as the sun began to set over the city. Well, just this very, very bright light, brighter than a star, yeah. and it started to move, and within the space of a few seconds it was moving up, and then it just blinked out, just went, just gone. And it's the first time I've seen anything like that. Just amazing. Incredible as it was, this latest sighting was for me a personal confirmation that the existence of unidentified flying objects is a global reality that has touched the lives of countless individuals around the world. I flew to Alice Springs to meet local researcher Keith Douglas, who had arranged for me to interview Marilyn Armstrong, an Aboriginal artist who claims to have had numerous encounters with UFOs. Got two pointy hills close yeah. together on the left. That's where Marilyn lives up there. That's 30k out. Marilyn, when she was a young girl, yeah. oh, she's what did the doc paintings. Oh, right. So I got she'd done a painting of UFOs for me. Yeah. Right. And that same UFO showed up last month up at Whitehall. Well, they had these road parties. You know, they was doing this road, or they were extending it for the rail, and it was the same thing again. What colour? It was a blue one. The blue one? Yep. Yeah, but see, my nephew, the same one, was driving the um, Falcon and his wife was there. Mm -hmm. And I said to his wife, see, I think there's a blue li uh, light waiting for us. And my nephew said, oh, not again, auntie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's them, all right. So we're driving along. It was just there in the bushes. And I said, no, it's coming up. It sort of came up and it was... You can see the spinifex and all the scrub sort of blue colour, but it was shaped like that. A little was window. That the same as same, the it was, painting. It was the same, same exactly. One came back. Yes, and I said, there it is again. I said to the um, nephew's wife, see, that's exactly the same uh, flying saucer that we saw at the honeymoon's cap. And she couldn't believe it. She looked at it and she looked at it. It is. And I said, see all them little windows? And then after that, keep looking, keep looking. Because my nephew didn't want her to look, he was so frightened. And I said, we keep looking and then all of a sudden it just went. But it was so beautiful. And I said, I don't, you know, well, I don't mind one day I'll probably come face to face with one of them. You know, somebody's going to come and see me and talk to me. Mm -hmm. You never know, eh? No. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be, oh, destiny. Alice Springs is also the home of the top-secret United States-run Pine Gap facility, which is a ground station for a satellite network that intercepts telephone, radio, data links and other communications around the world, and also forms a part of the US defense and satellite communication system. Access to the facility is via an innocuous dead-end public road. Also accompanying us was researcher Kathy Dickman, who was intending to personally deliver a videotape containing various UFO-related material to the front gate security guards. As we drove past the menacing road sign instructing us to turn back, I began to question Kathy's intention to hand deliver the video. So we're going to try and get as near to the main perimeter gate. As we yeah, can. well, there's two or three gates. And the first one's just a basic check one. Right. We go up to the first one, that's about as far as you can get. What, what am, shall I just walk up there? Or? Oh, are you coming with me? No, you go. This will go. You go. You go in I've got to let that. That's pretty lucky. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, is it? Sorry. Good afternoon. I just, uh, I've got just got a little video here. So if you'd like to hand it over to your radar department, they might enjoy looking at that. It's uh, very interesting. Are you going to take some footage? No, I'm just going back there. No worries. OK. No problem. So, just thought we'd uh, hand that over and I hope you all get to see it and enjoy it. We'll pass it on. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. OK, thank you. I just said to pass it on to the um, radar department, there's some interesting footage they might like to see, pass around and enjoy. Simple as that, wasn't it? Sure. <laughs> you know, and that's what got me into this, so I went on a search 
for the last, oh, I don't know, 40 odd years. I've been looking for answers to all these amazing and weird and wonderful experiences I've had. Uh, mainly through the psychic and the spiritual, where like the most of the ones that I've had communication with over the years are more spiritual and they're very concerned about how this government, how the countries are going and, and what the, our governments and scientists are doing to this planet. And they're trying to awaken people to their spirituality and say, look, you know, get your act together. You know, we, God created this beautiful universe and this world for us all to live here in harmony and to try and um, look after it because we're only the caretakers. And I mean, so that was just great that we've actually got uh, Today Tonight, Channel Television, Channel 7, to come out and do an interview with you. They're very, very interested. In fact, I think they want to get a sort of a documentary. And um, if we can pick something up on television tonight, that will just blow them away. He's a sceptic who's been converted. Christopher Martin was once a disbeliever. Now this controversial British author travels the world filming UFOs. And he's currently in Brisbane. Tonight he reveals never-before-seen footage, which he says is proof we're not alone. As to its authenticity, well, you be the judge. Michael Beatty reports. At Wyvernhoe Dam, just outside Brisbane, a group of UFO enthusiasts is hoping for a close encounter, one that might even convert the sceptics. The spheres, I would say, are uh, about 30 feet, 20 to 30 feet in diameter. Uh, very silvery, very, very reflective. Um, no seams or portholes or windows, just like huge great pearls. Well, they may have come here, but so far they remain unlikely to come out, just like some earthly celebrities. I headed back to the UK with a deep sense that the UFO puzzle might never be resolved. The visitors were here but seemed reluctant to come out of the shadows. And yet these otherworldly objects continued to appear over the skies of London. This mysterious object was filmed over East London in June 2003. And this strange tubular shaped UFO was filmed in West London in August. This translucent object was filmed in South East London also in August. And so the question we should be asking ourselves is not so much whether is there anybody out there, but rather are we prepared as a species to confront our innate collective fear of the unknown and reach out to whoever or whatever might be out there.